Thank you, Jesus. 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 Have your way, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, have your way, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let your word go forth, Father. Have your way, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, have your way, Lord. Yes, have your way. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Rokotere satere. Rando basakate. Jesus. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Thank you, Father. I'm going to get right into this. I hope all is well. Um, this word is something that has been bubbling in my spirit for some time now. And uh, the Lord... Jesus. The Lord gave me a phrase and he said, the fall of man. And it was as I was looking at the calendar... And thinking about the, the, the seasons changing, okay? And I am going to let God have his way. And I know it might be a little bit late, but this is when he wants this done. And I'm going to listen to God. Thank you, Jesus. There has been such a warfare and such a onslaught towards the children of God. And but see, the, the beautiful thing is, it is that God uses it all for his glory, for his kingdom, for his purposes to shape us to be more like Jesus. To be more like Jesus. And when the Lord gave this phrase to me, probably over two weeks ago or, or so, I just, it, it hit my spirit and I said, God, what are you saying? The fall of man. And you know, fall is like this week, right? And I mean, the new Jewish year and, and it all coincides. And I said, God, what are you saying? And I just began to wait. And to listen and to war. And he just began to speak to me about the flesh and the works of the flesh and the spirit and the move of the spirit of God and the way that God is doing what he's doing and using the foolish things to confound the wise. And make no mistake. We can trace this thing. We can trace this thing. We can know whether somebody is operating in the Spirit of God, in the fruits of the Spirit. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the Lord just began to talk to me about this is a time where He's truly dealing with the works of the flesh. And it starts within his people. It starts within his church. The Father's heart so desires that we would love one another. But there is just this onslaught of devouring. This onslaught of just this falsehood of church. And it grieves the Father. And even many who believe that they're doing what God wants them to do, they've gotten off track. See, there is a place where you can have a fire. But what is your fire for? And I believe, and I could be wrong, that this goes with strange fire. What is your fire for? Is your fire for Jesus or is your fire for something else? See, what happens is we get so zealous and so passionate about one thing that we forget the good thing. And so, you know, maybe 
you ever seen somebody who's just so zealous over somebody's deliverance or, you know, this or that or demons or, or, you know, um, projects or whatever it might be. There's a million, tribulation or the rapture or blah, blah, blah. But this is not lifting up Jesus Christ, nor is it giving the answers, which is only in him right? He is the only one who can give us the answers. He is the only one that we can lift up and actually see effectual working of his spirit. Anything else is a falsehood. It is a falsehood. And he was speaking to me, showing me in so many ways. This is a time where there is a remnant Jesus, have your way, Lord. The least likely ones, the ones that the world wrote off and the ones that God has been shaping and molding to be his weapons of love. You see, without love, you don't know God. And you have truth, but without love. Or you have love, but without truth. There has to be a marrying of the two. They have to go hand in hand. We cannot do one without the other. You know what happens? We wound the sheep. We we wound the sheep. Jesus said, a smoking, what did he say? A smoking flax, I will not put out a broken weed. Reed, I, you know, a, a, a crack, whatever. What he's saying is mercy triumphs and with what mercy you show is what will be given to you see how merciful we are or are we just looking to find something we can take credit for ourselves and this is where there's a remnant and and i'm telling you that it Mm, thank you, Jesus. The Lord has been preparing his weaponry. Okay. And not just that, but they've been in a wilderness training. Some of you have been in training for years upon years. Okay. It's just specific to each individual. There is no, you know, one way. You see, God does many things, you know, biblically yes but differently with each individual because we're all different you know oftentimes we find ourselves where we just want you know well well it doesn't look like how it, it, it happened for me it doesn't look like how I think God should do it for you well you know no you're not where you need to be and and where is the unity where is the brethren's unity? Where is the bond of love? What is it that has happened? And, and here's the remnant. And the remnant is currently walking out of, I see it. Thank you, Jesus. The wilderness. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'll be transparent. I have been warring. I mean, warring. And you know that when you know God and you know his character and you know how good he is and you know he's in control, then you can rejoice even in the tears and the weeping and the not understanding and the pain. <laughs> I went to Firehouse yesterday and the word was so powerful. Now, okay, Pastor Marcus Rogers, he is what what is what is the controversial right you know i swear people either love him or they hate him but the word was straight from the spirit of god and it was about how some things only come forth with blood sweat and tears and how you know jesus was in the garden and he was literally sweating blood and he didn't want to go to the cross you know and how we try and be pretty and we try and act like we have it all together and we try and act like there's something wrong with weeping and sorrowing when god the whole time is looking looking for a remnant, looking for a people who would give everything, including their reputation, to lay their lives on the altar. Why? Because the world is lost. And not just that, but the church is off. And it's not that I'm accusing or, or God is just, you know, pointing fingers. No, what it is, is the gospel has been lost. The true power of the cross, a crucifixion, the life of Jesus, the simple message of the cross 
has been buried and lost with all this other philosophy and even, you know, the preparations and all this worldly knowledge and the times we're living in and the tribulation and the rapture and, well, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. No, God is going to happen. And God is dealing with the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. What did he say? I'm going to go to Galatians 3. First of all, I'm going to go to Galatians 1 and 10. <laughs> and I love this verse. This is like a life verse. <laughs> it is. Uh, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, would not I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, when you have a position of leadership, or even without a title, you consider yourself to lead people in a, a, a gospel setting. You, you proclaim to, to, to teach or to preach about Jesus and your, your desire is to save souls. You, you must have a revelation of Jesus Christ. You must have the knowledge that came straight from heaven. And I think part of the problem is we want to slack and we want to cut corners and we want to get the word from someone else. And we want to live like this cultish life where one person tells other people how it's going to work when God wants you to go right to him. God wants you to get the download from him. God wants you to fast, to pray, to consecrate, to dedicate yourselves. Jesus. And so what happens is we try and give the world the sheep, the sheep, the sheep. See, this is the thing. God cares for his sheep. He sent his son to die for his sheep. My brother said, they're precious cargo. Yes, they are. But are we going to God first to figure out what it is he's saying? What it is he wants? And how about this? Are we examining our own hearts? Are we looking within ourselves? Are we really dedicating our hearts and our bodies, our flesh, everything we have, our minds, our lives to say, Oh God, God forbid that I, that I, I misrepresent you, Father. God forbid that I wound a sheep. God forbid that I say the wrong thing. And of course, we're going to mess up. Of course we are. Of course, we're human. But are we going to be humble enough to say, you know what? I was wrong. I'm sorry about that. That was not God's spirit. That was not the spirit of God moving in me. Because we're human, right? But there's this puffed up, right? Oh, it looks so good. And, all, and it's like a, it's not God. It's not God. And if we would be honest... When you're processed, we've all been there. We've all been at that place. We've all been at that place where, you know, we, <laughs> I hear you, Lord. I remember when I first like got zealous for the Lord. <laughs> I remember I told this person, you're going to go to hell. And I was like passionate and I was yelling and like, that was not God's heart. That, that was not, see, God is gentle. God is gentle. God is kind. God is merciful. His mercy and his grace, right? They, they, it's unmerited favor. And it's like we have this, this extreme. We have one extreme and we have another extreme. And the Lord, you know, he will allow you to go through something to see something, right? If, if we would just count it all joy and that's like, okay, it's a saying, but it's real. If we would just count it all joy, but there's like this extreme where it's like, well, the gospel is completely watered down and it's about, you know, let's this feel good message. But then on the other side, it's like, well, uh, uh, you know, just this, this almost like just 
robotic thing that is not going to save anybody. It's actually going to push people away. And God, he's, he's calling for balance. He's, he's giving his remnant balance. And he, they're walking out of the wilderness. And now this walking out of the wilderness and, and, and walking into the promised land, there is such an opposition. And I'll be real. It's an opposition I have never quite experienced. And see, I can be transparent because I know transparency will breed something powerful, not just within me, but somebody else. Somebody needs to hear how hard in the spirit we're pushing forth. You know, God said to me the other day, charge the gates. What did Jesus say? He said, look on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against the servants of the Lord shall be condemned. This is our heritage. This is, you know, the, it's literally like I feel like Isaiah 54 is literally playing out right before our very eyes. And if you go and you read it all, it's so real. We are being stretched to the point where it's like, don't hold back. Give it all you got. Make room because I'm coming in hot. And it's him. He's coming in in a way that we've never experienced and it doesn't make sense and it's not something we can put our fingers on but he's doing it and he's going to use anybody who's willing to humble themselves humble themselves he will give grace to those who humble themselves and being humble doesn't mean that you just lay down and take it jesus was so humble he wept and he was bold he was a lion, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, literally. So it's it's something that only God can give you. But we have this generated thing that doesn't come from the spirit of God, whether it's one extreme or the other. And it's become a zealous for works or a zealous for, you know, our own idea of what God wants. It's not the will of the father. And, and he's saying this is a fall, the fall of man. And, and it's real. And it's the fall of flesh. The fall of fleshly works. What did he say? Oh fool! I'm at Galatians 3.1. Oh foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? You know, he, Paul, I love Paul. Of course, Jesus is number one, but Paul laid his life down. He laid his life down. I mean... <laughs> This gets me, you know, my brother today, he said, you know, in the cross, there's love and there's hate. And I was like, huh? You don't have to explain that. But I listened and I was like, whoa, you know, the love of Christ and the way that they hated him. And I sat back and I was like, wow. Jesus literally loved to the point where he laid his life down. And yet because of his love, they hated him. They hated him and he still, still was up there watching, looking down, suffering, having to raise himself up just to breathe. And he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, we here we are trying to cut and to bruise and, well, I'm just going to proclaim the truth and, the da, 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 and, and wounding the children of God because we're trying to be God. We're trying to be God. There's only one God. There's only one Holy Spirit. 
And only he can do it. And oh, how pleasant is it when the brethren dwell in unity. And I don't know about you, but I bet that all of you have experienced the perfect bond of unity. And you have brothers and sisters where the Spirit of God just flows like butter. And there's nobody trying to prove anything. Nobody's trying to be better. Nobody's trying to know more. Nobody's trying to correct somebody else and trying to figure out, well, what's wrong with this person and what did they do? And I'll tell you this. If every single person, brother, sister, ministry in your life, you can pinpoint and figure out what is wrong. There's something wrong with everyone. I'm here to tell you there's something wrong inside your heart. And take that to the Father. If you can't find something good in everything, then you're not moving by the Spirit of God. Because God looks at our ugly, wretched mess and he pulls out the best and he elevates it. He takes the best of us and he takes the rest of us in our ashes and he gives us beauty. And if you can't look at someone and see the beauty and you can't look at someone and see they're made in the image of God, then there's something wrong with your heart. There's something wrong with your walk. There's something wrong with your faults. Jesus that ain't got nothing to do with the Holy Spirit and that's just the truth and the father's coming He's coming to deal with it. And you know, how he's coming through his remnant Yes, through his oh, yeah, there'll be a judgment throne in the days to come. You know, nobody knows right nobody knows but even now the lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring in his remnant in his people that have been forged in the fire and the mire all of it forged in his love Forged in his grace, forged in his mercy, in their mess. And they understand how good he is. You see, God is a good, good father. He is not sitting on the judgment seat ready to condemn and, and destroy everybody. No. What does the Bible say? He is long-suffering, willing that no one should perish. You know, there's, there's a, a fearful gospel that honestly at old times in my walk with Christ had me paralyzed. Well, Jesus is coming now and, and you better be ready and, oh, what'd you do wrong? And, oh man, that ain't right. And, oh man, you know, tribulations. Come. Oh, you better be prepared. Look, all you got to do is look to heaven. All you got to do is get in your prayer closet. All you got to do is get in your word. All you got to do is know your father. And then you're going to know because he's going to forewarn you because he's going to be walking right with you. And you're never going to be caught off guard. But what happens is we want to prove and we want to, you know, usurp the authority and we want to manipulate. There's this manipulation that is just not of God. And I love, I hear you, Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'm going to go to 1 Peter 5 because <laughs> the Lord is because the Lord reigns because <laughs> the Lord reigns he rules and he reigns and that means I don't get my way that means we don't get our way you don't get your way God gets his way and our job is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Our job is to be an example to the flock. That's our job. We can't fix anybody. And we can give them an example. We can point them to Christ. We can teach. We can preach and do whatever it is God's asking us to do. But is it from the right spirit? Is it from the right place? What is the intentions of our heart? Is it to get attention? Is it to, to have a, a group? You know, is it to whatever? Is it to please God or not? Because if there's any other reason than to chase after the heart of the Father, we're off. And it's the fall of man. And the rise of God, the rise of his spirit, the rise of his love. 
What does Joel 2.28 say? In those days, after those days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. But it doesn't mean all flesh will react. That all flesh will you know, rejoice in the Lord or come to his knowledge or humble themselves or, you know, see the truth. But he's doing it now. 1 Peter 5, 5, 2. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. That means you know Jesus for yourself. That means you have crucified yourself and you are walking in the spirit and you are walking out his will. That means your life is an example of, of what it looks like to die with Christ and be resurrected again. And then guess what? His spirit reigns. What are the fruits of the spirit? Because if it's not, what is it? Joy, love. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now you have love and you have self-control. And they hold everything else together. But if you don't have these fruits of the Spirit, if they haven't been cultivated within you, and it takes through trials, tribulations, also just humbling yourself and letting Him reign, seeking Him in prayer, seeking Him in His Word. And it's like we have a... Uh, a, a generation of, you know, not just leaders, but this is like for, you know, leadership because leadership, you know, and it doesn't mean you have a title. I mean, anybody who proclaims that they're leading people to Christ, that they, they know Jesus, that, you know, that they're in the army of God and, you know, let's do this. Well, but do you know Jesus? But has he cultivated himself inside of you? But have you went through the fire and the trials and the floods and the flames? And have you come out not smelling like smoke and, and pure gold? And Because this life will never be perfect. But, you know, some things, and this is what was preached yesterday. It was so powerful and it was so on time. But Brother Marcus was like, you know, some things only can be accessed in the heavenly realm through blood, sweat, and tears. Not, you know, your following, not, you know, your, your, your church, none of it. But through you and the Father alone, blood, sweat, and tears. And okay, maybe there's brethren that may come and walk alongside of you, but ultimately it's a relationship between you and Jesus Christ. And in that relationship, the word of God begins to be formed inside of you in such a way that cannot be denied. We've got far too many leaders or people who proclaim to lead that don't even have fruit that don't even have proof that the hope of glory lives within them. And this is a problem to the Father because there's many, many babes in Christ. There's many, many, you know, young sheep that, that are being, you know, misled and even pushed away from God. You know, we can say something that can cut so deep that somebody just stops their walk. That somebody just, it's like they get stuck. They get stagnant. They just, they're paralyzed. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And you can believe. You can believe, you can rest assured that, that anybody who really is trying to walk with God already knows what they need to do. 
They already know what the father is telling them. They already know what they're not doing right. They already know what they're doing wrong. They don't need condemnation. They need an example. They need somebody to walk alongside of them and hold their hand. There's no rushing what God wants to do. His timing is perfect. And we can't rush the things of God. We can't portray that we know his plan or we know, you know, what he exactly is going to do. We know in part, you know, and there, there's, yeah, we can have all these things. But if we don't have love, we're like clanging symbols. We just, we just make noise. And honestly, it's demonic and it doesn't rattle any gates of hell. We're, we're operating from a place of hell, literally. And it's, it's just so sad. It's sad. It's just heartbreaking because so many people don't know Jesus. So many people don't know, you know, his character and the church. It's, it's our responsibility to shine his light, to be his character, to, to let him live within us, that they would know who he is and not just that they would know him, but that they would want him, that they would desire him, that they would see within us who he really is, that he is love and he, he's just reaching out his arms to a generation, to a people, to every single human being, because everybody, Every person that God created is made in his image. But we, we go and we look for what's wrong. And God may point out things to us, right? He may do that. But it's to go into the prayer closet. It's not to expose everything. Sometimes maybe he'll have you do that. But it is not to go gossip. It is not to sit around the table to discuss Johnny's progress and Joey's progress and Sarah's progress and well, how are they doing and, and how? No, God is good. What's God doing in your life? What's God doing in your, oh yeah, God is good. You know, we, we sit around the table, but what is it that we're lifting up? Are we lifting up Jesus? Are we lifting up our brothers and sisters in prayer? Are we lifting up a demonic agenda where Satan is just sitting back and laughing? He's just sitting back like, huh, yeah, I got him sidetracked. I got him off course. As a matter of fact, maybe you never got all the way through the process. Maybe, you know, the, this is because there was a place where it just stopped. The revelation just stopped. It's like, okay, that's it right there. That That's it. We got that. You ever notice how sometimes people just talk about the same things over and over again? You may see them months and months and months. And yet it's the same subject that has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, that's an obsession that's unhealthy. That's a wound inside that needs to be dealt with. And beware of people who are so willing to listen to everything that is happening in your life or what God's doing, but they never really have any fruit of what's happening in their life, what God's doing in their life, how God's moving in their ministry or in their family or in the things that they are touching and putting their hands to. You know, we really need to have a true discernment. We really do. We need to have a true discernment. Jesus. Jesus. I'm going to go to Galatians 5 and 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another beware lest you be consumed by one another I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust 
of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Jesus. My God, Lord Jesus. Jesus. And you know, when you're operating in the flesh, any spirit in the, in, the, in the kingdom of darkness is then have a legality to come and operate through you. Any spirit, any demonic spirit can come and operate through your flesh, can come and talk to you, you know, th through your mind, through your will, your emotions, you know, and we can get zealous, but are we zealous for Jesus? Because if you choose to chase after Christ, you will be persecuted. You will be sought after by the, the kingdom of darkness. You, you, you will probably stand out like a sore thumb. Okay. But you will also become more and more like God. This is not to say you're God. No, there's one living God, Jesus Christ. But his whole goal is for us to be conformed to his image so that we could be walking around showing the lost, the hurting, the church, every person who he really is. You know, we have this idea of him and we've all gotten it wrong. Let's be honest. We've all been wrong. We've all been off. But are we advancing in our knowledge of the will of God, of, you know, the ways of God, of who he is? Because it's like the worst thing to misrepresent him, to proclaim Jesus. And yet we don't have his character to say we follow after him, but we act nothing like him. We walk around with bitterness and hate and fear and anxiety and all of these things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. But God has a remnant. A remnant that is literally coming out. And I mean the violent, the, you know, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And this is not for the meek. It's not for the weak. But see, when we're weak, he's strong. And we, you know, we forget that. We think we got to be strong in ourselves. We think we got to have it all figured out. No, we, the weakness is power. Tears are power. And I'm convinced, <laughs> I'm convinced, I am convinced that in this walk with God, that there will be tears, that there will be suffering, that there will be persecution, that there will be situations that are messy and chaotic, and that through it all, we can have peace, through it all, we can have joy, through it all, we can show the world still, even still, what his character is, we can still walk through it. And treat people with respect. You know, honor. This is the thing. These are, I'm going to let the Lord speak. Honor. What, you know, do we honor one another? Do we honor our brothers and sisters? Do we honor every person we come in contact to? Or is it conditional on if they're doing what we want, doing what we think? Or are, are we jealous or, you know, whatever it is, it's just not God. It's not God. God resists the proud. He resists the proud. You know, he is humbling the proud. There is a wisdom that comes from a carnality. And yes, in the church. Yes, in, in, in you know, the, the place of... See, judgment begins in the house of God. Okay? And God has been giving us so much time... And it's, it's coming to the, the point where he is dealing with these works of the flesh in such a way. And it's a light and it's a glory that shines bright in his people. You know, for I consider that the present sufferings do not compare with the glory which shall be revealed. Jesus. Romans 8, 1, 8. But 8, 1, 9, you know. What's it say? It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. 
to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Those who walk by the Spirit. What does it say? 814. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Not led by our opinions. Not led by the 98% truth. Not led by the situations in the world. Not led by our fears. Not led by what we think might happen. And let me just say this. If you come across anyone who proclaims to know the book of Revelation and know exactly what it means, better run because nobody does. <laughs> nobody does. I say that and I'm serious. Nobody knows what exactly God is saying. That's such a mystery. There's so much there. And maybe he will reveal parts at different times and still nobody should be proclaiming that they know exact. No way. No, it's not possible. We are not God. We do not have it all figured out how the end times and how this and how that's going to go. No way. How prideful are we if we think we actually know? God is intelligent and he can change his mind. And that's biblical. He changes the times and the seasons. He takes down kings. He puts kings up. God does whatever he wants. That's why it's so important and such a key to be in our prayer closet. And I believe that's what God is really going to deal with is those ministries and those individuals who have not been in their prayer closet. Those ministries and those individuals who have not sowed into the spirit. They have not put the time into God in the things of God in the secret place where there's no credit. There's no reward from man. There's no, oh, look what I did. No, nobody sees it. Nobody knows. And this is the word of the Lord that now is the time where you shall reap what you've sown. You shall reap all the years and the tears and the sowing into the spirit. We can rejoice if we've been sowing into the spirit. God will not be mocked. He, he will not be mocked. Do not be deceived. I'm at Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It's reaping time. Praise God. Many of you are about to reap a harvest. Reap a great thing. Reap restoration. It is time. It's go time. It is go time. You've been forged. And... and it's also a fearful thing if, you know, you reap into the flesh and, and the sad part is sometimes uh, we, we don't realize that we're not reaping in the spirit. We are, are sowing into the flesh. We are operating from the flesh and our carnality and our ideas and our op opinions of what we think, you know, God is doing or saying in his word or just in the spirit. But if we're not really in our prayer closet in a place of humility and look, we're all flesh and, and, you know, full of the, ourselves when we come into this world, right? But the more time you spend in his presence, the more he will make you like him and the more he will humble you and give you the truth and show you yourself. The closer you get to him, the more you realize how ugly you are inside without him and how much we need him and how we need his his spirit to to ebb and flow within us. Galatians 6, 4, but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for each one shall bear his own load. 
You know, and what does he say in 6-2? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You see, there's people that need our help to bear their burdens. What does this look like? It could be you see them struggling in sin and you take it to the prayer closet. You see them struggling. You come and you give them a hug. You let God talk to them because God is never condemning them. That is not God. That is the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. And guess what? He's been cast down. No longer does he have the power or ability to stand at the throne and accuse God day and night. So when we find ourselves in that place, we had better repent because there's power in our words, power to create and power to destroy. And God wants us to build up, to build up one another in love and yes, in truth. But how about you begin where you walk in it? Too many self-proclaimed leaders that aren't even walking with Jesus in the truth. They're not walking in the in in his spirit and, and really crucifying, you know, really paying a cost for the anointing. It's not even an anointing. It's a falsehood. And God is dealing with it. He is in this time and he's using the remnant. He's, he's using situations. You know, he's using everything. I'm going to go to 2 Timothy 2. You therefore, 2 Timothy 2 and 3. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel for which I suffer trouble as an evil doer even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. <laughs> Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. There's a glory coming. I'm telling you, it's a glory in the people of God. See, we are his glory. We are his glory. We are the glory of God. This is what he wants to do. He wants to, you know, forge it. He wants to forge it. But there's a cost to carry the glory. There's a cost to really be a message of Christ. It's not in words, right? It's in power. It's in an anointing. It's in his presence. It's obvious. And it's coming to pass. And the fruit will, will not be able to be denied. And God is mm, anointing and uniting Jesus, his true people, in such a way that it's obvious and it will be proclaimed. And unity is necessary. And we might not all look the same. We might not come from the same place. We may have completely different testimonies, right? But God will bring us together when we have come to a place of unity with him. We can't have unity together in, in ourselves and our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. If we haven't unified ourselves to Christ, right? What did Paul say? He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. Yeah, he says, but God forbid, I'm at Galatians 6 and 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything 
but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, that's a real thing. And I'm not going to go into all that, but that's a real thing. God will literally have, you know, uh, you go through certain things that will bear marks in your body for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and are we willing to really pay a price for the anointing of Jesus to live, to rule, to reign within us? Or is it just a game? Is it just a part-time thing? God is dealing with it. He's dealing with it. And it's, it's, it's not necessarily going to be pretty. And so this is where we, we say, God, what's in me that needs to be removed? God, what, what is it you want to do? What God examine my heart, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, don't, don't let me be in error. Father, keep me humble because he will do it. He will keep us humble. He will keep us in a place that, that he is able to operate through us powerfully and beautifully. Because I'll tell you this. The world is in need. They're in need of his love. They're in need of his love. You see, God is love. And the only real power we have is found in that. And we will sanctify ourselves in the truth and become a flame of love. A flame of anointing. A flame of his presence. A flame that when you walk into a place, the anointing will break yokes. The, the, the atmosphere will shift and change. And it's not about what you say. It's about who you carry. That's it. It's nothing you did. It's not to boast in it. It's just to say that you laid your life down in such a way that the atmosphere shifts. The atmosphere changes. Imagine Jesus walking into a room. That can be you. Not that you're Jesus, but you can carry the hope of glory in such a way. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to, you know, do anything. You just have to be and allow him to reign in your mortal flesh. And he'll do it. The Bible says it. Every word of God is true. <laughs> yeah, let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs> I'm at Hebrews 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls that's one of the enemy's great tools to discourage us to keep us down and it doesn't say look on to a ministry, look on to a leader, look on to a person. No, look on to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. There, I can't finish your faith. Nobody else can finish my faith. It's only Jesus that can finish our faith, that can complete that good thing, that can keep us in his perfect will. No safer place to be. And there's a remnant. And yeah, the, the, the enemy's trying very hard to, to keep this remnant from coming forth, but nothing will stop the plans of God. Nothing. He who endures, right? We just keep on enduring. And we understand what our Lord and Savior went through. And so we know he will empower us. He will preserve us for his heavenly kingdom. He will keep us in perfect peace because our eyes are fixed on him. We can praise him no matter what, right? It doesn't matter what we go through. If we're in the will of God, we know God has a purpose for it. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 10, and I'm nearly finished. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 10 and 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ's, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ's, even so we are Christ's. He goes on to say in 10.10, For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. God has a way. God has a way. And I love this. I, Paul is, he's just so powerful because he's so humble. And he just wants Jesus to do whatever Jesus wants to do in him, through him, and for the saints. He's not worried about himself. He's worried about the souls. He's worried about the kingdom of God coming forth with all power, all authority. But it's in his humility. It's in his, his surrender. It's, it's in the presence of God that he carried. I can only imagine. He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 12, of course, he says, you know, that God's grace, right? God tells him, look, I'm not going to take that thorn. You're, my grace is sufficient. But he says in, in 2 Corinthians 12 and 15, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. And we can only imagine, you know, what, um, what Jesus went through. We can only imagine, you know, the truth walking in the world, God coming in a, in a fleshly body. And, and being the truth, the way, the life, you know, everything perfect, our creator in the flesh and all he went through and he just loved. And this is why we need the presence of God and the prayer closet and the word, because this world, if you really want to live for Christ and really truly want to be uh, uh, Christ like you will suffer persecution you will be misunderstood and it's more about in the in the church and in the people of God than it is the sinners no the sinners will be drawn to the Christ in you <laughs> the sinners will receive the love in you the sinners will receive the truth it's the the self-righteous Pharisee religious you know spirits and demons that will will think to usurp you and think that, they, that, that you're something you're not or you're not something that you are. And if only we could come to a place where we just loved on one another, where we just walked in the truth, we did what God told us to do, and we just were a flame of love and encouragement and, and edification, and we could just link arms. How powerful. It's coming. It's already here. And it's coming, and it's coming, and it's raising up. Because this is the fall of the flesh, the fall of man, and a new beginning, and a new shift. Many prayers are being answered in this time. Many prayers are being answered in this time. Prayers of restoration, prayers, and tears, and pain. God is about to bless some of you in ways you cannot comprehend because of his favor. Because of his unmerited favor, right? His, his grace. It's grace. For by grace you have been saved. Lest you think you can boast. No. 
No, it's grace. It's his grace. But he's just looking. His eyes are just searching to and fro. Who can he show himself strong in? Who is humble enough to carry him? Father, have your way. Jesus. The evidence is obvious in the fruit. The evidence is obvious in the fruit. And there's some of you who've been walking in the fruit and you've been walking with the Lord. And it's a time of restoration and great blessing. And he's going to use you in such a mighty way for the harvest. And even when you see him correcting those you know may need it, right? We had better walk up to them and give them the love of God. We had better walk up to them and take their hand in humbleness. Because we need one another. We need one another. In true unity, truth, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. God is long-suffering. Now these abide faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It's in his love that he's long-suffering. Let us be long-suffering. Let us be a, a people of self-control and kindness and meekness and gentleness. This is him. This is who he is. He is so kind and merciful. He's not there with a gavel looking to judge you. We've all come short of the glory of God and yet he will take it all and he will use it and turn it around for his glory. And there's many testimonies and stories and powerful things that are about to shift the whole world. The whole world. And this is a new season, a new era, a new place. And um, praise God for the blood. Praise God for the blood. What would we do without the blood? Where would we be without the blood? Thank you, Jesus, for your blood, oh God. We thank you for your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Because it's only the blood. And when God looks at us, he sees the blood. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your blood. We do not take it lightly. Father, help us to see what we don't see. Oh, God, help us to see what we don't see. Oh, God, all of us, help us to see what we don't see. Help us come into a unity, a bond of peace, a perfection in your love. Oh, God, that we would see how you see, that we would look at the people and see them how you do, that we would walk together. Oh God, that we would walk together, Jesus. <sighs> Hallelujah. I just heard kingdom marriage. <laughs> kingdom marriage. The Father's putting people together for his glory, for his kingdom. You know, the whole idea of marriage for God is that two people would come together as one and glorify him. It's not about what we can get. It's about what we can give. <sighs> I hear him say it's not what, it, what you think it's going to look like. It's not what you think it's going to look like. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> he does exceedingly abundantly above all we could think, imagine, ask. According to the power that works in us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, be encouraged. If you're going through warfare, if you're going through the suffering, if you're going through the trials, that God has a purpose for it. God has a purpose for everything. And he's bringing us out into a wide open place. You know, into, you know, opening this this gate. It's like there's the gates are opening. 
There's a wide open space that is set before the remnant, the, the true people, the ones that have, have went through the trials and the processes. And, and it's like the, the last round. What did the Lord say to me? He said, the final lap. This is what he said. He said the final lap. It's like the final lap. Press, press, press into his presence. Press into that place. Crucify those fleshly things. Go in, press into more. Because there's such a place of the unknown in this pioneering. It's truly a pioneering. It is, it's truly a pioneering. That God has, has, you know, asked us to go forth in. And pioneers, they, they go into places that are unknown. They, they, they plow a path that has never been plowed before. And so I just encourage you to walk in the spirit and walk with him and talk with him in the secret place. Rely on God more than anybody or anything. Because he'll get you through. He will get you through and you know, people might condemn you. They might misunderstand you. They, they might think they know what they really have no idea of because they haven't paid a cost. They haven't paid the price. They haven't laid down their lives. They haven't lost their reputations and everything considered to be rubbish. <laughs> to carry the glory, you know, to carry Christ, the hope of glory. But even then, we have to find it in ourselves to forgive, to lay it down, and to not let anything make us bitter because that's not God, but to be there with open arms because that's who he is. He's raising up the standard and uh, true shepherds that just love him and love his people and just want to see the people of God advance. It is a time of advancement. It is. People are going to be put in positions that many may not feel that they deserve. But God. God knows the cost. God knows the secret character. God knows what you're doing when nobody's looking. God knows what you're thinking when nobody's looking. God knows. And he will reward you openly. <laughs> he will. It's his word. And his word can't return void. And for many of you, it's a time of payoff. Well, for all of us, it's a time of payoff. But for, for many of you, that could be a blessing. Because you've been sowing into the secret place in the spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Because he loves to surprise his children. Right? Right? He loves to see, you know, us be obedient and he loves to surprise his children. He loves to, to give us things that maybe we don't feel we deserve or to give us things that we didn't expect or, you know, to, to place people in our lives we didn't see coming. Or maybe we thought it would be years down the road or months down the road. And he says, no, look, I'm going to do it now because of your perseverance. I'm going to do it now because I want to surprise you. And then the Lord is literally just vibrating. <laughs> like I just feel like his power because he just loves us so much. And this is what we're in need of. We're in need of his love. We're in need of his, his presence that breaks the yoke and it's the power of love. And when we can really begin to see people like he does and ask him for that, because we can't, but he will do it through us. He will possess us. Then he will bless us. Because he can trust us with his, his precious cargo, right? His sheep, his creation, his beloved, his beloved. You know, the very thing he... he the whole point of it all, that we would dwell with him for eternity. He wants us to carry it now. He wants us to know him now so that we can bring heaven here and now. And we can't do that striving and, and backbiting and bickering and complaining and pointing every, every fault out. He's not looking at us and, and pointing everything that's wrong. 
He's loving on us to where we're empowered to do what's right, to overcome those sins and those shortcomings and those things in our life. We need his character. And he's raised up a people. He's raised up a people. And though the war rages on, it's a time of battle, but we already won. And there's a victory cry in the spirit right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the enemy has come up against the remnant, trying to keep them in the wilderness. And you know, there could be many ways he's done this or tried to do this, but it's time. It's go time. It's go time. And so I just encourage you, keep going. Keep growing. Keep listening. Keep learning. Keep forgiving. Keep loving. Because God ain't finished yet. He ain't done with us yet. He ain't done with the world. He's still on the throne. And it might look one way, but what is he doing? What is he saying? He's so beautiful. He's so amazing. And he's so good. And if we can't proclaim that in our lives and show that through our character and, and the testimonies and our fruit, then what are we really doing? You know? Yeah. Because he is good. And he has a good plan to give us a hope in the future. This is his word. It's who he is. He is the word, right? I love you all. I gotta go. This is really long, but... But God, he's worthy of it all. He's worthy more than we could ever give, more than I could ever give, you know? And though we don't have to work for his love, we don't have to earn his love. We can't earn his love. We can't do enough. We never could. But you know, his love, when he loves on us, it makes us, God, what do you want? God, what do you want? What do you need? What can I do for you? What can I do for your children? What can I do for your kingdom? And this is what it is, true servants. Hallelujah. Jesus. Be blessed. Be encouraged. God is in control on the throne and he has a beautiful plan. Jesus. Thank you.